Hello there, I'm Derek Fournier and welcome to Plain Spoken, a podcast where we get real about business, leadership, and life. I've spent years in the trenches of leadership and team building, and now I'm bringing those conversations out into the open. We're going to talk strategy, dissect success, and maybe share a few laughs along the way. Each episode, I'll be joined by fascinating guests, from successful CEOs to brilliant minds shaking up their industries. We're here to offer you insights, challenge your perspectives, and ignite your curiosity. So whether you're a seasoned professional or just starting out, there's something here for you. Join me on this journey of exploration as we make sense of the complex world of business, one conversation at a time. Let's dive into today's episode of Plain Spoken. All right, welcome everybody to today's episode of Plain Spoken, where we delve into stories of those who inspire and guide us to greater heights in personal and professional lives. Now, you guys know me, and I, I work with ChatGPT and AI a lot. I'm a technologist by trade, and I do leverage those tools. And I was joking with Hugh uh, prior to the show that I have it write some basic stuff for me, but I always edit it. And the next sentence simply made me chuckle because while it is accurate and I think very fair, it is heavy handed. But it said, our chat GPT overlord said, today we're joined by Hugh Edwards, a transformation coach, serial entrepreneur, and a beacon of light for those searching for purpose in their careers. Uh, that is all true. And we'll get into why he is could be perceived by the overlords and by you, in fact, as a beacon of light. Uh, but first, I want to talk about the fact that he has a rich background. It spans high profile roles at Goldman Sachs and Bridgewater Associates, as well as an academic pedigree that makes me incredibly uh, trigger my inferiority complex. From Oxford and from Harvard, you know, if you if you can't do anything, you might as well go to one of those two, I guess. But he's here to share with us his unique perspective on how aligning our head, our heart, and our hands can lead to a fulfilling career and life. Hugh, thanks for spending time with us today. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you so much. I'm honored to be here today, and uh, I love being described as a beacon of light. And I don't know what you fed in to ChatGPT to get that specifically as well, but <clears throat> I grew up in a little uh, little village in Wales, inside the Brecon Beacons National Park. Oh! And because the, they're known as these, these peaks that are like beacons. And so uh, I think it's really neat that like the idea of beacon and light, and I think in my journey, I, 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 I like to bring, hopefully bring light and, uh, and positivity to any room that I go into. So uh, I'll take it. Excellent. Well, I think it was apt. It's just one of those things. And, and again, part of our sort of off-air conversation. And in my years of sports broadcast, we used to hate doing off-air conversation because often you leave so much good stuff there because it's yes. it's genuine and it's spontaneous. And that's really what you're trying to capture in anything like this is yes. that genuine communication. Um, but what those tools can do, amongst other things, they, they are a vastly powerful set of tools, but they can they raise the bottom stack of communication written communication, certainly, from where it was, you know, a solid 30% forward. So if you've got garbage copy, it's really <laughs> just laziness. Now, will it create the next great writer? And I I pull back who I will claim is a, a great writer, because that's a matter of subjective opinion. But words that move and words do move me don't come typically from this tool. So you've got to go back in there, edit. And I, I tend to take uh, take the shot to have fun with it. But I do find you to be a beacon of light. I met Hugh uh, back. We were coached by uh, the same coach uh, in our yeah. executive days. And we had this cohort that we got together in. And all kidding aside, you know, there are people in life who do simply sort of ooze positivity. And, and, and that can go too far sometimes. Like sometimes you get these up with people, people, and really you just want to hit them with a sledgehammer. <laughs> Um, I can honestly say, Hugh, I've never felt the compulsion to hit you with a sledgehammer. You have, in fact, frightened the rooms you have entered. And it seems as though you have sort of parlayed that in some way uh, into your next venture. Because when we met, we were in very similar private equity backed. I believe you were private equity backed. Yeah. Um, but exact, certainly yeah. corporate, uh, certain, certainly corporate environments. And you've gone off and created a very different thing. Uh, in fact, our last conversation I had with you, you were walking around with your newborn uh, yes. with, on the headsets. And and there is a lightness to you that is incredibly genuine. So tell us a little bit about that. Tell me a little bit about what you've been doing, what your journey was like going from high finance into coaching and where you are now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, happy to share. And yeah, it. I mean, what a 
definitely a transformation uh, or a big change from our first interactions, which also was in the sort of the summer of the pandemic, where we were very much um, on uh, living the Zoom life. I think we were sort of, it was very much like in that like throes of just being stuck on our uh, on our computers uh, and to then be like this sort of new life, like I said, a baby now uh, pushing around, you know, sort of managing, you know, doing conversations whilst uh, 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 managing other aspects of life. Um, so for me, you, know, you mentioned a little, you were kind of to mention some of my background. I never really you know, uh, wanted and and chased after fast cars and McMansions. But for me, my struggle was always, was my very variation of I'll be happy when. And it was very much like, well, I'll be happy when I go to Oxford. Like, clearly that's what's missing in my life. I need to go to like a great, you know, like a top university. And uh, or it's like, oh, well, I grew up in the countryside in Wales. Like, I'll be happy when I work for the biggest investment or the most famous investment bank in the world. And that really, that you know, that that whole process was exhausting. And it probably that whole thing probably lasted um, for me, uh, you know, a good you know decade and a half of of my life. I would say from from ninety eight, ninety nine, through twenty fourteen, when I you know when I was at Bridgewater. And that's when things came crumbling down for me of realizing that like, if I, if, if that, when that, ha I'll be happy when fails at Bridgewater, there is nothing left. <laughs> <laughs> like there's, there's nothing else to be able to say, well, I mean, I guess maybe if I was became president of a country or something, it was like, this is, a, this is the pinnacle there of, of achievement. And I'm miserable. Um, and I really did go on a bit of a journey then. I went on an entrepreneurial journey, as you said. I did a, a PE-backed business, private equity-backed business. I then spun out a startup, which I then, um, uh, which raised VC money. And that's when we were spoken. So we'd raised a bunch of venture capital money. Um, and that startup didn't work out. Um, we did not find the product market fit. But I had a, you know, a number though. I had a successful exit and a startup failure all come to head in 2021. And it really, you know, I really had a transition then. It was really like, well, what do I do now with the rest of my life? Like, right. what do I do now that I, when I grow up? And it really was, it's almost like the 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 road had run out. It's like I'd, I'd already run out this corporate road. And then I'd done these things that I'd fallen into, the more, you know, these like these two entrepreneurial ventures. And now what? And it really was the moment of... Um, for me, and I can talk a bit more about this in a minute, but a couple of things stood out. But one of them was was hearing uh, a guy called Rory Vaden, a speaker new, and New York Times bestselling author, say you're most powerfully positioned to serve the person you once were. And that was one for me that really was like, wait a second, okay, I am really, you know, really powerfully positioned to help people like me or where I was a decade ago, where I was back in the corporate environment, where I was when I was miserable in my career. Um, and that was one of the things that really sort of led to this new thing of like, how can I uplift other people? How can I be that beacon of light that chat GPT that can help guide other people out of their, you know, present darkness, whatever that might be. That, that quote is powerful. Um, and I am a sucker for quotes, to be honest. So I'm going to do some research and look that up and see if we can spin on that for a little while. But it's, uh. It's interesting. So now with that knowledge or with that thought uh, that you are the person best suited to help the person you were, mm -hmm. uh, you got out of, you know, the, the we'll call it the rat race. It's a yeah. stupid colloquialism. But whether you're pursuing, right, I'll be happy when is really mm -hmm. just the pursuit. Your pursuit was academics and then prestige and mm -hmm. these sorts of things. They weren't it wasn't tied towards uh, more uh, commercial purchases like McMansions, as you mentioned. It was other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then you got a bunch of those other things and, and you didn't find yourself where you wanted to be. Yes. Um, and so then you had this opportunity to do a reset and, yeah. and you've done that. And, and it's, it's very interesting because you do have all the background to do this reset very well, right? So you've got your website up, you've got all the stuff going and you've gotten into something that we experienced as customers of coaching. What is your unique spin on it? There is this, you know, H3 is your website, h3.xyz, I believe is the actual mm -hmm. URL. Um, and 
it stands for, I have always assumed, and, and I believe this to be true, head, heart, and hands, mm -hmm. right? So I'm a huge fan of systems like that. So mm -hmm. tell me more about how you took all those experiences with the backdrop of this, this quote about being mm -hmm. positioned well to serve the person you were mm -hmm. and converted that into a system mm -hmm. that is now part of your platform. Yeah, I think it really comes down to the, I was blessed, uh, both probably nature and then nurture growing up. I had my, both my parents were teachers and I always asked questions. And so the curiosity was always fueled. And let's be clear, I was good at math. I was good at school and I excelled. <clears throat> and if we're really putting it there is like, I had a pretty good brain. And then I, 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 I built that muscle, you know, I practiced it. I used it. And then I became over-reliant on it. And I think most of us as humans become over-reliant on our brain, on our head, on our intellect. Um, but I think particularly for high achievers where that, you know, intellect has cut through, so has opened so many doors, has given so many opportunities, has led to so many uh, work and career and educational advancements to become crazy reliant on that intellect on the head. And so for me, you know, um, my shit, you know, the pinnacle of that for me was working at Bridgewater, right? And Bridgewater is like, you know, the pitch was, seriously, the pitch pitch when I, when I got a call from the headhunter was, do you want to be an intellectual Navy SEAL? Really? I mean, God damn. Uh, right how, I how, how, do you say, how do you say no to that? I mean, how do you, <laughs> how do you say no to that? You know, it's the biggest hedge fund in the world to be an intellectual Navy SEAL. And and so that was, and Bridgewater with all its frameworks and models, I still remember, like, I had a miserable time at Bridgewater, the amount of feedback that was being given, uh, the amount of inner pain I experienced as a result. And I still remember when I tried to quit Bridgewater, you know, I had a moment one day I'm driving to work and, uh, and I was taking the long way to work, right? I was driving extra. I only had a 10 minute commute and I'm driving like 15, 20 minutes just to sort of prolong get into the office. Um, and remember, I'm managing a team of people. <clears throat> and I remember thinking, I just want to drive my car into a tree. I, mean, I, I, I just, I don't want to end my life. I just want to like wreck a car, spend the day at urgent care or at the shop dealing with like a broken, like I just did not, anything to like not be in the office. And that was the moment for me, I knew that something had to change. And uh, and the next day I walked into my boss's office, or maybe it was that day itself, walked in and said, you know, I quit. And in typical Bridgewater fashion, the response was, well, what's your framework for quitting? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this sucks. Uh, I'm a, a, an at-will employee, like, see you later. No, it's and it forced me to really look like, what are the things that I, Bridgewater values excellence and truth and i like to be excellent and i like to be truthful and not be false but i realized that i valued other things more i valued autonomy i valued flexibility i valued being able to be emotionally present with my family and this place was not allowing that and so i was able to articulate what enabled me to be able to articulate that but the funny thing the other big thing that came from bridgewater is it was so stressful I learned to meditate. And so Ray Dalio is kind of famous as saying he attributes, you know, almost all his success to meditation, specifically transcendental meditation, but meditation is meditation. So I learned right. how to do that, that kind of meditation at Bridgewater. And that was the beginning of a journey of me of going more inside, going more inward, starting to listen to that, you know, the voice of more the intuition. And it has been a journey, you know, over that decade of various other, you know, life experiences. I, you know, I was an alcoholic. I became sober. I ended up uh, leaving a marriage. I had truly did some things and had a spiritual awakening. And in these cases here, it's where I really awoke the, the heart, so to speak, realizes that there is all this wisdom, you know, in the heart, in the emotions outside of what I think is the right thing to do. And what I got became, you know, what I realized in that, in, in do in this, in this journey is that it combining these two things is incredibly powerful. 
And that's where for me, it's it's not saying, hey, throw away the intellect or forget, you know, overthinking and just like be emotional or just be, you know, it's like, wait a second, if you can integrate these two things, this powerful horsepower of intellect with tuning into some like your intuition and like connecting with your feelings, not, you know, shoving them down and ignoring them. If we can pull those to combine those things together, it's a very powerful combination. But very the, interesting. Very yeah. interesting. Go, go ahead. You you were you were, I assume, going in two hands or no? Yeah. And then and then then that's the thing there, which is like, and all that's great, but if you don't do anything, yeah. so what? Right. And so that is really then it's so easy to end up, particularly when you're stuck in the head, to end up in analysis paralysis. I just need to spend more time to think. But it's like, okay, when do you integrate those things, two things together? And then take inspired action and then start to put, you know, you know, what are the next best steps or the best, the way I like to say is the best next step. It's not a right. second best step, but it's like, this is the best next step. It doesn't need to be the perfect step because there's always course corrections. You're always sure. going to be able to adjust that whole thing. It's like, you know, when a, a rocket's on its way to the moon, it's off course what it is like 90% of the time. Right. A rocket, is, right. it's always being course correcting back and forth and eventually gets to the moon or gets to the right orbit. Um, and so be able to then, you know, combine those two things with inspired action. And I'm a big believer in, uh, you know, a follower of, of, um, uh, of James Clear and Charles Duhigg and all the folks who've done a lot of amazing research and publicized habits for the power of habit with Charles Duhigg, atomic habits, of course, with James Clear. And this, you know, I always love this quote from James Clear, you know, you do not rise to the level of your ambition, you fall to the level of your systems. Right. So it's this, okay, great. You've got this horsepower of a brain. You're now tuning into like, you know, the the intuition and the, the messages of the heart. And how now can we turn this into like habits to like, you know, continue to sort of execute and make progress day after day. And so that's kind of been my philosophy. And that's what I, you know, I had done and, and sort of evolved over that decade period. And truthfully, some parts, you know, you know, came, you know, I've always been good at sort of then executing, but it really was developing that intuitive, you know, heartfelt connection was the one that what took the most time and were some of the final pieces and the ones that I think are often most missing. I've got a bunch of notes I want to follow up on, but one of my yeah. other questions was was really around you. You had recommended a book to me called The Surrender Experiment, which I did go and and consume. Um, I actually did an audio, audio version of the book. I didn't read it uh, with my yeah. eyeballs, uh, though yes. I I tend to do a little bit of both. Uh, really interesting book. Now I, I I will I will couch this in I am not what you would call a spiritual person in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. I have gotten to the point in my life where I am no longer actively trying to talk other people out of being it because I'm just being an <laughs> asshole, which is what I was like in high school. Uh, right. You, you think about the, the neoclassical atheist thing, or they're going to try and speak reason to you. And that's not my deal. And, and God knows it doesn't matter right now. I'm at the point where if it makes you a better person and you're better to the people around you, I don't really care what your driving motivation is. What I did find interesting about that book was the, the, the author's, focus on himself and he went into meditation mm -hmm. he didn't do transcendental meditation as a primary mm -hmm. he did a different form of meditation mm -hmm. and there are plenty mm -hmm. and in fact one of my favorite podcasters and academics though he also happens to share a, a bit of a spiritual side with me is uh sam harris mm -hmm. and he has an entire platform around meditation and uh quieting that inside voice mm -hmm. uh etc now one of the things that I want to highlight, well, two things, because I, I took notes and I should make sure that I use all of those notes. Otherwise, why write them down? Um, your James Clear quote is funny because I used to always tell people, and I always attribute it to Robert Schuler, who I believe is the pastor, right? Mm -hmm. Very an, uh, animated. And in my head, back when we had only like five channels in the US, and I know in the UK, there were only three or whatever back then. <laughs> But you'd have church on the weekends. And, and I remember the spirited uh, sermon where he would say, don't just sit there, do something. And I yeah. thought, that's just a great thing to keep in mind because quite often we spend a lot of time just sitting there. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's out of fear. Sometimes it's out of apathy, right? Mm -hmm. The motivation can be varied. 
But the reality is the universe favors effort, action. Mm -hmm. So yes. even action in the wrong direction teaches you something powerful. Yes, and it so, does. Um, so that's that's a, that's an interesting carryover. And the last thing, and I'm really interested in your perspective here because I'm wrestling with it a little bit. And you asked me off air, what am I doing? How am I doing? Because I'm rebooting my world too. I'm learning what it is like to grow up uh, after after my last venture. And one of the things that my team and I uh, have been bouncing around and I am becoming almost a zealot about, um, which always worries me, is I think that in business we have had an incredible and willful neglect of a bifurcation of faith and science. And I don't mean that in a religious sense, and I'm not mm -hmm. trying to start a religious battle, right? But if you, if you think about it, in any organization, you have the people that, that want all the data. They can't get enough data. They're voracious consumers of data. Now, if you're mm -hmm. lucky, you have some people in your organization who can turn that data into information, which is what I consider data with context. Because data mm -hmm. by itself is good, but not particularly useful. Until you give data a backdrop or context that you can then draw conclusions from, it's just data. Mm -hmm. um, but where things become powerful is on the other side of the house, for lack of a better uh, transition, you have your evangelists. The people that carry the narrative of the company, the story. Stories sell anything, whether it's your products, your services, or anything. People connect to stories. We, we are human animals, and we want that. But if you don't bridge that gap, if you don't give your faith, the people that are, I, I believe in this thing, I don't care what it is. It could be a coffee maker. It could be the next great technical widget, right? Mm -hmm. They can believe in it without any data or information, right? They can just have mm -hmm. blind faith. And sometimes they can even succeed. But where we think it can be powerful is if you can bridge the gap between the two. Does that resonate with what you're doing in your coaching? Because I know you're coaching some pretty high, powerful people, highly powered people. Uh, it definitely resonates. It's kind of funny as well because um, people are attracted to me and people, you know, choose to work with me because they see themselves in me. And I've had the number of ones have said, it's like, well, you're not an average life coach. You know, you understand what it's like to work on Wall Street. You get what it, what it, what it felt, what it, you know, the, the pressure of wanting to like go to a Harvard. Um <clears throat> And so they're drawn because of that more intellectual, you know, science aspect, right? And a lot of the work that I do, I have a program. You know, my core program is a six-week program that leads someone to clarity. And it's lessons and assignments, and it builds up. And the feedback that I get over and over is how the course compounds, how the self-awareness and the sort of exploration and, and the insights compound over time. So it's systematic and it and it and it and it uh, progresses progresses. But the interesting thing is is that within that, a lot of the lessons and assignments are much more getting people out of their heads. You know, I do a lot of guided visualizations where people then have to close their eyes and shut out the external world and, and then, you know, get listened. And it's not necessarily hypnotherapy, right? That's not my specialty or my, what I'm attempting to do, but is it bringing someone in and, and teasing out some of the, someone might call them the whispers of the heart or the universe, or like, you know, tuning into your gut. You might hear otherwise, but sometimes these inner knowings that the answers are actually there. If you're able to, to listen. Um, and so it, that is the aspects of this heart that, you know, that on its own, and it could be seen as quite woo woo. Right? <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and so it's interesting that, that it's combining those, but some of my greatest idols also um, sort of demonstrate this, this combination, like Einstein, Einstein was a deeply spiritual person. Everyone thinks about Einstein as the sort of preeminent, you know, scientist of our age or era. Um, and Einstein talked about like God. Um, he talked about imagination a lot that you have to imagine before you can create anything. Imagination is the precursor to everything in the world. And these, so it's like, I love these concepts, some of these, you know, these bringing together this, this, the, you know, these two worlds you described, the faith and then the world of science, how in some of the greats, they're so deeply combined. Um, 
I think as well, like one of my favorite, uh, favorite books, um, and I did it, we did it. I have an entrepreneur group that I'm part of, not one I lead. Um, and there are seven of us, uh, Texans. And last year we did a book study on Think and Grow Rich, the Napoleon mm -hmm. Hill classic. And again, this is looking at, you know, Henry Ford and, you know, uh, Carnegie and, you know, all the, all these greats. This is the, basically the learnings of, of these, you know, great entrepreneurs of their time. And it's a book about manifestation, right? It's a book about, you, you know, imagining and, and then creating from the imagination. And so I just love the way these things intersect. And I think one of the challenges of our times is that we have managed to separate these two camps, the faith and science, and separate these things so much that and have made it more black and white. You can't have in both. some ways more more than separate, and, and I'm certainly as guilty as anyone in this, we vilified vilified the, 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 the alternative the counter. Yeah. Yeah, the counter. Yeah. So so it's funny. I, I have recently fallen into the Simon Sinek rabbit hole. Um, and I don't think that's, that's a bad one, by the way. Um, I, I find him to be fascinating and, and I, much of what he says resonates with me. Mm -hmm. Um, but I quite literally, uh, was watching a YouTube video at lunch today and he was discussing, uh, aspirational goals, right? Purpose driven life kind of thing, right? There's mm -hmm. a, a pile of folks who write in this space, which is great. Mm -hmm. Um, but he, he mentioned that the last president to talk about in their inauguration speech, and I, I couldn't hear the second one. So the second one could have been more recent, but it was Reagan and, mm -hmm. and it wasn't anyone in the last like three or four, right? Yeah. And he's like, when did we stop aspiring for world peace? When did that, when did that fall out of favor to want peace? That doesn't mean that you'll have perfect peace and constant peace and all those other peace, but as an aspirational goal, if you don't have this aspirational goal that both teams, uh, my friend Bart always talks about it's just a team sport, Yankees and Red, Scott, Red Sox yeah, for, exactly. for Americans, right? Uh, then all you do is say why you're better and the other one's not because all you're arguing about is the same thing because you don't have a common goal. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's very interesting whether that's manifestation. And you're right. You said woo-woo. I certainly get a little bit skeeved out when I see some of this stuff. Uh, that's like uh, coaching in general. We talked about this when we were both being coached. I resisted coaching forever. And I have been a coach of some form or fashion since like 1991, right? I get coaching in athletics, but the thought of coaching people to be people or to be managers or to be whatever just seemed alien. Um, but uh, finding ways to get people to listen to that inside voice. I don't know if you know who Adam Robinson is, but this was the first time I just was trying to think back. Why was this, why was this tickling something in me? Adam Robinson is a chess master, a uh, mathematician. Like I, I don't even know his true biology or biography rather, but I know that I was very active on Twitter at the time. And he made this comment about when he was in a chess tournament and it was silent. I've never competed at chess. I'm not even that good at it, but he was in a tournament and he's studying the move and he made a bad move and he's trying to figure out how to get out of this situation. And it's dead silent as those things are apparently often or always by rule. And he heard a voice that was not his inner voice tell him a move. And he was perplexed by it. It's, it's like when you're so focused internally and you're trying to figure it out and you're an analytic and you're going through these, you're working through all the permutations and he heard this voice, but it was outside of him. Mm -hmm. And it was the it was the the best move he could make, and it ended up working out for him. But he, and I think he ended up winning that tournament. But he went back to to analyze what the hell was the voice, mm -hmm. right? And he's not particularly spiritual, so he's like, I'll just call it magic. There is something that either comes from you or comes from somewhere. Don't know, don't care. Not trying to get to the root cause here, but when you hear it. Listen, and he likened it to when you're walking alone in the woods and you feel something like that intuition. People talk about mm -hmm. intuition all the time. <clears throat> yeah. Intuition is a thing. We may not be able to measure it yet. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but it's a thing. So yeah. I would recommend I, I and I, I follow him on Twitter and he followed me back, which was, you know, in Twitter. That's fun when someone that you think is really yeah. cool follows you back on Twitter. And we've had conversations back and forth about certain things like this. But I think that this ties into another topic. I'd love to hear your uh, your opining you have you opine about the thing that i latched onto late in my managerial life uh through the encouragement of people who i love respect and trust was vulnerability 
mm-hmm. and the the importance of expressing vulnerability to your teams, your friends, your family, your colleagues, not running around saying all of your weaknesses. It's not that. It is not always thinking because you hold a title or because you're you're going down a road embarking on a business journey that people expect you to have every answer. And mm-hmm. further, they don't expect every direction you give to be correct. But if you if you just course correct and don't acknowledge, right? Acknowledge with with good faith. And good mm-hmm. faith is something I think we have sadly lost in the last 10 years, right? Uh, we've we've traded it for at best postmortems that are supposed to be good. And I think that academically they are. But if you sprinkle bad faith into a postmortem, it just becomes a beating session. So I know that was a lot of crap because I don't do one question very well. I tend to talk a lot. But what are your thoughts around these areas? Because I think we, we do pretty well with the volley. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> when it comes to vulnerability, that was definitely a big piece. I mean, I can, I can, I can point back to it. I had, as part of this upbringing, I was, you know, had that armor. I have to be the smartest person in the room. I have to project that smartest person, and to not show the weakness. And the challenge there is, is it doesn't allow people to connect. And so, and that it is in showing some of that vulnerability that you, the sort of, you can acknowledge the human experience and the human commonality, whether you believe in God or spirit or consciousness or whatever, but it's like, oh, I recognize some of me and you when you, you know, take off the armor where you're, where you sort of, you know, share more, more, you know, more more vulnerably about what something, you know, a mistake that was made of not knowing the answer of, uh, 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 of a struggle. And, and that's what really took me towards sort of, uh, you know, the, the work of Brene Brown. I still remember the moment I read Daring Greatly. And obviously it's the Teddy Roosevelt quote about the man in the arena, you know, that it's mm-hmm. about being in there, the blood, the sweat, the dirt in the face, not, you know, it's the person in the arena that counts and stumbling and struggling and um, and just the, the, the courage to do that. But then it's also the piece that I still remember, you know, listening to Brene Brown speak and being, and that doesn't mean that you vomit all over someone with all your, you know, it's like they, they, it has to be uh, 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 appropriate. And, um, but it is realizing this over the time that, over time, over this journey, and you've just, you know, you talked about that from my time at Bridgewater in 2014, and I started posting more on LinkedIn from about 2021. And I have reconnected, been reconnecting lately with older friends, classmates, people who I hadn't spoken to in two, five, or 10 years. And the messages I've heard of is uh, is one of thank you, thank you for sharing your story, and, and and I have been blessed with people saying things like, "Look, there's a lot of inauthenticity on these social media. I just love that you come across as authentic, that you're you're not making a big deal out of things, but you're also not hiding. You're sharing the the struggles that you've had, but also the the, the story arc. And it's like that is what I think is." Uh, really interesting here. There's that phrase, and I, I don't know where the quote comes from. Uh, I can't attribute it in my head right now. And it's like, people will forget what you say and people will forget what you what you did for them, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Yep. And it is in that, you know, that's how we create so much connection is be able to share some of us and we see each other's shared struggles. And it goes back to the powerfully positioned. It's like, oh, you get me. You know what it's like, and it's okay, and it's okay to feel like this or to struggle because we all struggle, and this is part of the journey. You know, it's it's interesting. Uh, I never thought when I started this podcast um, that it would venture into so many different areas. Mm-hmm. Um, it was really uh, the idea of a, a colleague of mine, dear friend, um, when I started writing my blog, he's like, well, I like... I like reading your blog. I like hearing what you have to say that way, but, but, but I like hearing you talk about it more. I, I mm-hmm. like that interaction. And, and he, he encouraged me because he's like, you know, you did a sports podcast for like 13 years. 
why don't you just talk about this stuff? And I was like, I don't think anyone gives a shit about this stuff. Like, I don't think someone would tune in to listen to this stuff because it's not like, I, you know, I'm not Steve Jobs. I mean, but what's happened is everyone has a voice now. And, and mm -hmm. I was a huge proponent about that. The democratization of that platform and how social media at an aspirational level uh, can truly level the playing field to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. However, um. You brought a word up that I think is really important and I think is going to be more important in the coming years, which is authenticity. Mm -hmm. And authenticity is great. I think it is required. I'd call it table stakes for any true relationship, whether you business, personal or otherwise. Um, I think that authenticity will be a currency moving mm -hmm. forward. People being able to validate authenticity of content, of data, of feelings of intent right this is a real thing because the the internet is awash with generated garbage right mm -hmm. and so while crowdsourcing became very popular because you figure oh well if we get a large enough uh sample size then statistics tell us we'll get the best answer if we sample that large section and crowdsource the answer mm -hmm. except that that presupposes good actors <laughs> right if you can simulate bad actors, and more importantly, if you can simulate intelligent bad actors to skew data, mm -hmm. then crowdsourcing and crowdfunding and crowd any of those things -ing is just trash. And so you got to go back to the thing where there's a concept of expertise and authenticity. And so yeah. I was joking with my friend Jim the other day. I don't know if you've seen the trend recently of going away from cloud services. Have you caught wind of this? I have heard a little about it. Yeah, go on. So I am a complete uh, 37 signals whore. Uh, I think Jason Freed and David Hennemeyer Henson are freaking fantastic. Now, I don't agree with everything they do. Don't get me wrong. But I think they're brilliant. I think they've done an incredible thing with their company. And I love their work. And they were way on the front end of giving the finger to Apple and the Apple Store with the way they were managing. And, and that's not me ta attacking Apple because of the chip in my head from working at Microsoft. That's just Apple was essentially abusing monopoly power. Sure. That There are rules for that that we have laws for that even artists have to pay attention to. Apple, uh, but they have strongly gone against this cloud thing, right? And everything follows this sine wave. I'm old enough, and I can never remember how old you are because you look young. But when I started in tech in '90, you know, we were going away from mainframes to uh, personal computers, right? And so you had this vast decentralization, and then you had a centralization. It's like it's like the uh, the universal intelligence is breathing. Right. We, we, we run down somewhere and we go, oh, this is the greatest thing we could ever do. Let's go do this as hard and as fast and as often. And every everything is going to be a subscription. Subscription is clearly the answer. I don't know about you, but I am sick and tired of having 40 subscriptions. I said literally the other day, I miss the cable company. Uh -huh. So uh, I don't know if you're seeing any of this stuff, right? But I, I certainly think that it is uh, is worthy of conversation and probably useful to our listeners if we can tie it into how they do business. Yes. Okay. Let me have a crack. <clears throat> two things, two sort of philosophies that uh, that 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 I that I have here. One is that firstly, I really push back against concepts of balance. Work-life balance, you know, and and by balance, there often is like, uh, like optimal, like there's like the optimal state. And because something that's balancing has been inherently precarious, right? It's inherently can go one way or the other. And I'm, uh, and is therefore, in a way, unstable. Uh, one might almost say fragile, or um, and where a lot most things, I'm a bigger believer more in like things just moving back and forth. The idea of the pendulum, it goes one way, and it's gone too far, and it comes back the other way. And the point is, it's always coming back and forth, but it never stops in the middle, because the middle isn't the perfect place either. It's just this ebb and flow. And I remember seeing this, uh, speaking about the cloud. Uh, I had the, uh, after business school, I went to work at Rackspace, 
which was you know one of the yep. sort of one of the pioneers of the cloud is sort of followed eagerly on the feet on the the heels of uh um of amazon uh side note the business i turned around at rackspace and then spun out was a company rackspace had bought in 2008 called jungle disk and jungle disk was a piece of soft was one it was a piece of software that helped you targeted initially in like 06, 07 at the sort of prosumer. Think about the nerdy guy, probably you, Derek, who read <laughs> PC Magazine and liked to like, you know, fix their own computer uh, and and tinker and and build. Um, and it allowed them to back up their computer instead of to a tape drive or USB drive <laughs> or a Seagate device or whatever they were to the Amazon cloud. Hence jungle disk it created a disk out of the you know amazon jungle um so i say that you know and that was one of the the, the first pieces of software that was really pumping data into the cloud as we know it now and so and i remember when i when i joined rackspace in my couple of years there there were always these reorganizations in the in a corporation right it's like oh we're going to organize all the sales, all the groups by 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 geography. We're going to have like U.S. West and U.S. Central and U.S. East, and everything's going to. And we're going to do like vertically integrated, so clients can like progress. They can grow through, you know, as they get bigger or they shrink from sort of the SMB, the enterprise, all in one. Like no, 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 no. We're going to restructure. We're going to have like an SMB division, a small medium business division, an enterprise yeah. division. Right? Yeah. You have these ones there where it's like, oh, we, you know, the classic thing is is like. Wow, we put a lot of uh, bureaucracy and processes, and we created a lot of stagnation. So we're going to create the, you know, what was it, the the, the Lockheed infamous Skunk Works, right? Yep. So you're going to find some teams and say, right, you're outside of the organization. You get yeah, tiger to go teams, out the tiger team, or like Skunk Works team, whatever. <laughs> like, and like you basically get, get you kind of sort of like almost from the top. You're going to give a budget outside of all the normal budgets and the normal structure. We're going to create team here so that you can sort of be free and be crazy. And then we're like, wow, that. They did a lot of cool innovation. Let's create more of those. And well, so now you have like 10 tiger teams and then you have chaos, right? And then it's like, whoa, we're going through a centralization, you know, restructure now. now everything is then pulled back in. And the point being, and you saw with people, they're like, oh my God, we're like, because I must have moved desk like 10 times in a year. And I swear to God, it was like the people who were really killing it here was the desk moving companies. These companies, like, <laughs> you know, you, 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 on a Friday, be like, you have to, eat, all these green boxes show up. And it's like, you have to put all your personal possessions in the green box and put your sticker on it or whatever. And then on Monday, like, you know, and like, you're, and, you're, and everything, we got, and then on Monday, like, you know, you show up at the new location and the box is there and your, your screens have been moved. And like, and there was always this restructuring of like the moving the people and people will get frustrated. Remember like, oh, fucking corporate bullshit. And like fucking, man, they, can't, <laughs> they can't decide what they want to do. And it's like, we just did that. And now we're back there. And I remember saying, I was like, look, firstly, it's like, this is more like an organism, right? We go back to, to nature. Like this thing is like, it, 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 there is no perfect thing perfect state that the organ the, the corporate you know form can sort of sit in and that's why we go from sort of centralization to decentralization cloud to you know on-prem you know set you know the centralized to like the edge and so so often and it's when it's, everything's out on the edge and i like we need to bring we need to bring the power more back and so i that's sort of one of my sort of philosophies that i saw in business, I saw it in the form of the cloud, but it's also a way that can be liberating. Like, look, don't, don't fight this, right? But also, don't ever expect that you're going to get it perfect. It's just like things will evolve, and you have to respond to the, you know the circumstances. I, I love the pendulum reference. I've used it a thousand times. Not the way you did necessarily there, but usually more with social issues, right? Typically, reaction to something is always really overreaction to something. And that mm -hmm. is what triggers the pendulum. So if you're way over here with your idea, then he, it corrects over here and then it swings, swing, swing, swing. And, you know, I wrote down when you said, you know, the pendulum is never in the middle. Well, if the pendulum's in the middle, the pendulum's dead. Yeah. The pendulum has stopped moving. It's stopped moving. Yeah. Right. Uh, and that's that's probably a really good way to visualize it. Uh, in, in tech, it's fascinating because we get to see these cycles sort of on an accelerated basis. And, and what's funny is, you know, you talk about it sort of culturally and socially. 
people are always pissed about change, but the reality is change is a reaction to stagnation typically. Yes. And, and so your choice is don't change and die mm -hmm. or give it a shot, right? We, we're successive approximation engines, right? So we're, we're going to give yeah. it a shot. We're going to throw the dart out there. And, oh, well, yeah. And, and when I was at Microsoft, it was funny. We were in one of the weird teams that didn't move all the time. Yeah. But, but it was very much the same culture, right? Yeah. Uh, you were moving from building to building and quite often you didn't stay in the same team for more than two years. You would yeah. move to another team and many times into a different discipline. Yeah. Right. To learn that other discipline, but bring the lens from your previous discipline to that room, uh, which isn't necessarily bad, but you have to be open and willing, uh, not necessarily be a change junkie, because there are certainly people like that. I consider myself a bit of a change junkie in that regard. Uh, but I know that that's weird. I know that mm -hmm. the, the norm, the belly of the bell curve is not that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that we do have to have some some level of acceptance for that. Now, in one of your newsletters, and I think I've heard you actually speak about it outside of the newsletter, you talk about the lone wolf balance, fallacy yeah. uh, and the importance of collaboration. Uh, and you referenced a mastermind earlier and some other groups. This is something that I have now. I have groups of people that I count on intensely. And in fact, in Rebooting Plain Sight Strategy Group, the the thing that allowed me to anchor in something I was passionate about was when I went from my what, what am I going to do? What services am I going to provide? And not even my why, which is what Simon Sinek would, would push you towards, right? Why am I doing it for my family and for people I love, but to my who? For me, my driver was, who do I do this with, mm -hmm. right? So that is a backdrop. Tell us a little bit about what you mean by a lone wolf fallacy. Uh, mm -hmm. And how you've leveraged networks of various types, whether they be masterminds or which seem to be relatively structured, to more ad hoc, uh, to 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 improve head, hearts, and hands. Yeah, what a great question. Um, I think it ties into a lot of that there, where it's like uh, when you're often stuck in your head and thinking a lot more from like what some might call the ego right mm -hmm. is this fallacy and 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 belief that like i can do it all myself and and i want to do it all my way um and it really took me um you know when i'd bought my first business with my with my pa my partner we bought it together we did a management buyout and it was like towards the end of the first year that i suddenly realized I have no one to talk to outside of my, I've got my business partner. We talk all the time. It's like, who can I talk to about the, the challenges of entrepreneurship? And that was realizing that like how lonely it was in entrepreneurship could be, you know, how it can be on or running a business. Um, and suddenly realizing that I, that it wasn't even looking for someone else with the answers. It was, you know, the power of having someone else who gets what I'm going through. Mm -hmm. And just to be able to then find a group, I joined something called the Entrepreneurs Organization, EO, where what I call a group therapy for business owners, right? right. And then, and being able to go through some of the, you know, have other people like, oh, I've got this problem with these employees or we're struggling with these costs. And someone's like, oh, yeah. We had that problem as well. You know, oh, it was worse. Oh, yeah, they stole from me. Like, oh, I'm not the only one with these problems. Like, yeah. I, it's like this. And so that mix of sort of shared understanding and empathy. And then being able to sort of see how other people were, you know, progressing. You know, it's a cliche, right? You're the average of the five people you spend the most time with, right? But this idea of like, if you want to get better at something, hang out with people who are really good at it and learn from them. I still remember, I've done a lot of running over the years and I was the fat kid at school. Let's be clear. I fell into running long distance to deal with my demons. Let's be clear. And I remember in some past running groups, we'd meet someone socially and they'd be like, oh yeah, I want to get back into running. I used to run or I'd like to run. And we're like, oh, we have a Thursday run group. Come along. And they'd often be, oh, I'm just going to, I'm going to train for a couple of months and uh, get back in shape. And then I'll start coming along. It's like, no, 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 no. Come this, th you show up on Thursday. No runner left behind. We have people of all paces. Just show up. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, don't, you show up to get fit. You don't get fit to be able to show up. Um, and so, because that process of showing up and being around people who are, 
you know, doing that thing or further along on their progression is what's going to pull you up. It's going to inspire you. You're going to learn from them and you're going to see, you're going to believe, you're going to see yourself in them. Um, and it goes back to that most powerfully positioned is when you meet someone like, oh yeah, I was super overweight and now I'm like running marathons. Like, wait a second. That's great because I wasn't inspired by Usain Bolt, but I could be inspired by that person because holy shit, like if they did it, I can do it. Sure. Sure. I mean, the inspirational tale is is one that has always been powerful. Sure. Um, and and I guess the other end of that is it can become preachy, uh, which you have to avoid being too much oh, of, of that. Um, uh, it seems like some of what you're pointing to there is one of the things we shy away from joining groups is is we're afraid of hurting our ego. Um, we don't want to be embarrassed, and and there's nothing wrong with that, right? Ideally, I, like being aware of that and acknowledging that that's a thing. The first thing to do is recognize there's a problem, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, then you can figure out how to address it. But I, I want to transition that into something I talk about with, I've talked about with people who I worked with for years. I've experienced it. I still experience it on a regular basis. And that's this thing called imposter syndrome mm -hmm. where, where people are aspiring to get into a room that they in their core don't believe they belong in. Yeah. Um, how, how does your coaching, uh, and I believe the phrase you use is career clarity coaching. Yeah. Um, how does career clarity coaching attack imposter syndrome? And, and by using that as sort of a jumping off point, tell us more about what your coaching methodology is, uh, and, and give people an idea of why they may want to reach out to you. I mean, I, I don't have much of a viewership at this point, but if people are listening to this, then they, they should damn well go to h3.xyz and at least see what you do and how you do it. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, when it comes to imposter syndrome, uh, two things. I still remember 2015. Uh, I had been hired as a consultant to help sell the business I turned around, a rack space, because they were short on people and I just left Bridgewater and it was like, hey, can you help us sell this business? And a couple of months in, me and my old colleague, who was running a business unit that this was part of now, we looked at each other and we're like, we should buy this business. Like, this is a great business. Like, we should buy it. And so, you know, one, it just one thing led to the, the other. Like, well, let's just see if we can find the money and see if we can find the debt and see if we one more step at a time. But I still remember being like, oh my God, like, I've never been a CFO. I'm going to be the CFO of this business. We're about to take on personal guarantees on $18 million of debt. And I was like, I don't have $18 million. Let's be super clear. <laughs> right. So like wh what that means is I've got a hell of a lot of skin in the game. And I remember two things, the two things, this comes to the imposter stream. It's like, who am I to be a CFO? And what do I know and whatnot? And the first one was the kind of, what's the worst thing that can happen? And it was like, okay, so say, I don't think we're going to screw up by like bad faith to use your words from earlier, but say Microsoft comes out with something and crushes us overnight, the market overnight. What happens then? And say the bank forecloses on the business and takes the business and then they want to put us in pain individually as well. So they, you know, put us into personal bankruptcy. And it's like, well, they could probably go back and get a job as a management consultant somewhere. Right. I was like, I, I'm a pretty smart guy. I could probably get a W2 job even if I had gone through personal bankruptcy, right? And so that made me think like, well, I could probably figure my way out of it. So what's the worst could happen? And then this was the real moment. And I need to get t-shirts made of this one. And this is what I share to clients. I had that epiphany. And I think many people have this roughly in their mid thirties. When they look around themselves and realize everyone's winging it. everyone's fucking winging it to pardon my, you know, the language in this podcast. But it's like, you look around, like anyone who's doing something for the first time is doing it for the first time. That person who's becoming the CEO of the company wasn't the CEO for the first time, wasn't the CEO before. So they're winging it. Every president of the United States, when they first took office in their first term was winging it. They didn't know what they were doing. They hadn't been president before. They, you know, most of their staff hadn't been in an administration before often. And when I, when I realized that, that we're all just winging it in life in varying degrees, that was a hugely liberating experience. Like, well, why don't I wing it? Why not me? 
So that's how I sort of, you know, I end up confronting the imposter syndrome and how I share with others. And then the other big piece, and this really ties into my coaching, we've covered the head, heart, hands aspect. But a pivotal moment for you, you've mentioned Simon Sinek two or three times today. And Simon Sinek has an amazing TED Talk. And he's a good, you know, he puts out good content, solid books. And I remember after my last startup failed, I was like, I'd been living the entrepreneurial life for six years. And I'd been living according to my values, the things that I hadn't been living about or to at Bridgewater or my corporate life. And I would, had been setting visions and achieving goals and creating a life. And yet I'd had lots of good days and bad days and highs of lows, even in those businesses. And I try to make sense of it. And I went down the Simon Sinek rabbit hole. Start with why. Okay, that's the key. I just need to start with my why and it'll all be clear. And I did the work. I, he has an online course you can do in a couple, you know, spend, you know, for a couple hundred bucks and then you sit down with a good friend and do this, help the, they can reflect back and listen to you and help the, and understand the stories you're telling. And it was this massive ball ache and I got a little bit of clarity and it was like, oh, where is this purpose? Where is it hiding? Did I lose it? I'm not sure what it is. Um, and I had a, I, I, there was a real moment. This is the second epiphany to the most powerfully positioned point from back at the beginning. I came across a Pablo Picasso quote. And Pablo Picasso was a very, very strange individual. This is not like, you know, a glorifying like, oh, yeah, it's like we're going to quote like Jesus, you know, because this is like Pablo Picasso. Um, and the quote goes this. The meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give it away. And when I heard that, I feel like my shoulders dropped, the weight lifted, and I kind of felt that peace. Because I intuitively, in my, in my being, understood, I think we're all here for a reason. And I think we each on this planet have a unique set of gifts. And some we were born with, and others were forged by our life experiences whether it's extreme trauma or just like a sequence of like, you know, circumstances and, uh, and, and situations in life that have then adversities that have created these gifts. And this idea that when we are clear on what those gifts are, when I recognize what they are and realize I've had these gifts often all my life and I've been given them, I've been trying to give them with my kids or I've been trying to give them with people I love or I've been trying to give them at work. And that clarity of like understanding what those gifts are suddenly like brings meaning to life. Oh, and that's why I'm here. And then realizing, wait a second, but purpose doesn't purpose. I don't find purpose. It's not hidden. I become purpose. I feel purpose fall. I experience purpose when I give my gifts, when I share my unique gifts, the things that I was put on this planet. Because if I don't share them, not only am, am I deprived, but the tribe is deprived. And there's a, there's a long history in, in many indigenous cultures separated across the world. Most cultures have some heritage around the concept of gifts and of becoming and belonging. And this idea that we all have gifts and the health of the tribe is required, is, is, is dependent on everyone in the tribe stepping up and sharing their gifts. And so this whole thing was very liberating for me. And suddenly it's like, oh, I'm not trying to find purpose and I'm not trying to optimize for my strengths. It's like, I have a unique set of gifts and I need to find work and a career and where I can express them and I can give them because that's where I'm going to have the sort of the, the biggest impact and both the biggest return to myself. And so that's a huge part of my program. When by work with clients, we, we go through a process to reveal their core gift and then how to integrate that into like assess how much they're using it and how they could be, what avenues could they be really, you know, giving their gift a lot more. There was a ton in what you just said. Uh, and it's, it's, there's so much there that I either need to bring you back or else we need to go and I'll have a drink and you won't. Uh, and we need to talk about it uh, around some of these core concepts, but I want to stick to business here for a second. And how do you give away your gifts and yet drive economy, which entrepreneurs need to drive, right? We were mm -hmm. talking about it before the show, right? It, we all want to do things that matter, but I had a dear friend, Cheryl. She, she actually is the founder of, uh, 
of my charitable foundation, What the Buck Really Matters. And she says she wanted her job title someday to be philanthropist. Because if her job title was philanthropist, she had gotten there. She had done enough that she didn't have to worry about the, the table stakes of life, rent, all that other stuff. She could just focus on doing for others. But that's not the reality for most people. So how mm -hmm. do you how do you square the the discovery of a unique set of gifts, the giving away of those gifts, but really it's more of a transaction? How do you do that with your business uh, clients? Yeah. So let's you just ask that there. Let me say so. You know, I'll describe it for my particular case right now. Like my core gift is helping others live a meaningful life. Mm -hmm. And I give it by helping them understand that their thoughts create their reality. What they appreciate, appreciates in value. And I inspire infinite possibilities so they can make relentless forward progress. And so what I realized when that came out was that like, that's why at times, I loved being the CEO of an early stage company because I was painting a vision of the future. I was helping people believe in this concept of a better world and a better technology and a solution to a problem. And I was creating those possibilities. And it was all in service of a better world, a better life, a more meaningful life for people. And it, but so that was how I could be some, oh, but then when I was actually making projects to trying to make trains run on time inside the company, like if I wasn't feeling like I was helping making people's lives more meaningful in those moments or painting these bigger pictures, that's where I was not, you know, in my gifts. It also is trying, means is like a way I work a lot with clients is I challenge and inspire possibilities. I often see ways that they could um, give their gifts in a corporate setting, give their gifts in how they mentor people, like in how they create value in the organization, how they unlock value for an organization, because their gifts are helping people understand each other. And so I'll have some people, and this is what's really interesting, I'll have some clients come back to me, they're like, hey, I've been really reflecting on my core gift and the core gift statement. And I think it means I either have to be a coach or a healer or a healthcare worker, right? <laughs> right. And, and, the, and I'll be like, Oh, interesting. That's really interesting. Because I see you as a general manager, as a leader of people, and not just a head of HR. Like I see your gift there is really about bringing a team together and bringing an organization together and leading through change. And it's like, because the, the often your gifts are one level below. So for example, that lady, like the, the gift is somewhere below being a philanthropist. That's great. We all want to help. But it's like, what? how exactly are you helping? Like, what exactly are you doing? And who are you helping? And how are you helping them? Um, so I think it's a great question. The, it's funny you mentioned that. My sort of signature, one of my, you know, the sort of the journey I take people on to, to particularly in response to this question that you said is the path. I call it the path to profitable purpose. Right? Nice. And it's this idea that it is a journey and it's about putting these things together. And it's not, it's not about like, great, this is my purpose. I'm going to quit my jog and I'm going to be woke, but broke, you know, living in a van <laughs> and teaching yoga. Like, I think there are many ways, particularly in this incredible time we live in this digital economy, in this online economy, in this wisdom economy, where our gifts can be, we can share our gifts and I don't want to, this is an interesting one. You use the word transactional, right? And I think as well, but it's all more, it's back to the, the pendulum. It's ebb and flow. Money is just energy, right? Money is just energy moving back and flow. And we get all caught up on what money is. And we, some people think it's great. And some people think it's evil, <laughs> but it's just money. It's the way it's, it's a, it is literally this currency that we can create commerce that I create something and you create something. I create this, you know, I bake this beautiful bread. You, you know, nurture these seeds. Oh, wh I would like some seeds and you would like some bread. And we're going to like, I'm going to give you some bread. You're going to give me some seeds. Right. It's sort of like this barter economy. And then we got so much. We the economy was transformed when barter turned to an actual currency that we could that was more fungible. But really, it's just moving about of this like energy. And so I actually think that that is where here, like by giving your gifts and serving your highest good, 
creates value. And that value will come back and you can put an immediate price on it. Or, or I think, you know, this like doing this good, good things come around in that, in that realm, because it's back to Simon Sinek. Then, then you're switched on, turned on, you're tuned in, you are lit up, you are fired up. You're in the state of flow that the, the, those hand acts, those next steps are so natural. And one thing's lent to another and momentum, momentum, momentum. And that's where you get to, you know, really sort of build over the long term and you're creating value for others and value is being created for you. So it's very interesting. This ties back into the book that I referred to, um, the surrender experiment, because that was really very much what the author did. He, he pursued his quiet, how to quiet that voice in your head that, that distracts and, and annoys and frustrates and in many ways is self-defeating and simply said he was going to give himself up to the opportunities that he was presented with. Exactly. And so he did that. And if you haven't read the book, it is it is a very good book. It's a great audio book as well. The narrator does a great job. I think it's actually him who narrates it. Um, yeah. uh, and it's weird because he, he's in Alachua County, which is in North Florida. And listen, I come from Polk County, and we're only allowed to make fun of people from Alachua County. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's the way it works. And he actually takes some shots at Alachua County throughout the book intentionally because it is not known to be a progressive stronghold. Let's put it that way. Uh, so, so this yogi uh, in the middle of Alachua County, just outside of the University of Florida in Gainesville, uh, is a bit of an odd, odd thing. Um, I think one of the things, and maybe I'll use myself as the everyman to speak in response, is if we act truly in good faith and ignore our experience writ large, mm -hmm. that whole thing can become easy to do, right? You just do the right yeah. thing. Yeah. Just do the right thing. And, and you hope that the universe makes it happen, whatever you define the universe rules as. I don't really care. Mm -hmm. But then you fast forward from being a 21-year-old idealist to a 52-year-old, uh, at best, pragmatist, uh, at worst, cynic. And, and cynic, and not as in Simon, but cynic with a C, uh, is dangerous and poisonous. Um, I used to use a phrase, I'm not a cynic, I'm just a realist, and most realists are truly cynical. And... That was an incredibly negative outlook, and it didn't do me well, right? It was it was funny, right? But so so much of humor is is dark. Mm -hmm. um, but how can how do you recommend your clients fight through the bad experience where they went and they did the right thing, and maybe they did, and I'll call it pro bono work because that people all they get what that means. You're doing the right thing for a company because it's the right thing. You're not worried about how you're going to get compensated. And you go and you help them, and then they screw you over somehow. They don't do it. Or maybe it's not even uh, an elected decision. Their thing didn't work out. They couldn't compensate you. And so now you're having to do something that sucks for you and your family because you spent all your time giving mm -hmm. your gift away. How, how do you counsel or coach uh, your your clients uh, to either disregard, acknowledge, and move forward? Like I'm sure there are a number of techniques. It's a great question. I mean, it starts with, and this is one of the things that I, uh, and goes back to both my core get, gift, it starts about gratitude and appreciation. Like it's about developing a, a mindset, a practice of gratitude. And it's it can be as simple as like, I'm grateful for clear water, a clear clean air and drinkable water. It's like, it's like putting things in the sort of in the, in the context of life. Um, it's about seeing the gift in every adversity. I think that's one that came out to me a lot in the book, The Surrender Experiment, is the opportunities right. that came out. There was a lot of adversity in that book. A oh, lot yeah. of shit happened to, to the, the protagonist, not to spoil it for your audience who hasn't or who haven't read the book yet. Um, and it's in seeing those gifts and it's and by instilling that, and that's where complimenting gratitude was sitting quietly. Sometimes it's hard to be grateful. Like this sucks. Hard to be fucking grateful right now. But it's like, <laughs> but it's like finding those ways to have some respite. And you've you talked referred to my newsletter a few times. It's about, you know, it's finding your thing. It, it's walking in nature without a phone. Key, key distinction without a phone. Right. Walking in nature, you know, disconnected. Um, it's about making some space for that silence. But then appreciating the things that have gone and even appreciating the things that went badly and for the lessons and gifts that have come from it. 
to realize that this is all part of this journey. It is this contrast. No one goes through life and does like, you know, doesn't experience hardship or grief or loss or something. And it's about, and if we did it, life would be really boring. Right. If it was just the same each day and no, no, none of that, like sort of the. So I think it's also it's appreciating. I love this one, appreciating the full spectrum of life, like the full spectrum experience. Um, and then and again, like I said, it's like that wisdom that's being brought out of it. And bra a pra a sort of gratitude is a practice. Like what you appreciate appreciates the more you do it. And it's like often it's the balance, because if you're 49 or 51. You know, only 49 grateful, 51 like lack or, you know, that that will add up. And, and I'm not saying, hey, you got to be like grateful 90% of the time. It's like <laughs> but you, need to get, you need to get over 50 and get to 51 and get to 52 and get to 55 and like 60, 40 grateful. Like suddenly we're like we're starting to rock and roll here in terms of what we're seeing and the possibilities um, that can come. And it's realizing that you know, that is, it's like also the other one, I still remember Deepak Chopra, when I heard him speak, he's like, do you want to be right? Or do you want to be happy? <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? And I'm like, just giving up the need to be right. And so often in what in what you're saying there, we need we find we need to justify my clients find that's experienced this a lot. It's like, what is what happened happened? And let's find the lessons from it versus justifying, like, who was wrong, or what was the, you know, dissecting it to the to the nth degree. I'm not sure if yeah. I answered your question there, but you you did you did you answered it as well as I think it can be answered. Um, sure, and because because there aren't I mean the reality is there aren't always it's not always a math problem, right? Not a math um, problem. No matter what Terrence Howard wants us to believe, that's a deep reference, by the way, for anyone who wants to Google. Terrence Howard's gone a little bit off the rails on some math. Uh, it's good. a it's a fun YouTube rabbit hole. Anyway, sorry, I, I I have an odd sense of humor. There's a quote, and I can't remember who it's from. Uh, but I liked it when I heard it and the quote stuck and the attribution failed. So I'll go try and find it and post and put it in there. But essentially it was someone who you wouldn't expect it from. So assume it's some sort of a scientist who said that he chooses to be an optimist because of math, because if he's an optimist, he can only be disappointed once. Now it, it, it harkens back to stoicism, right? It's not the thing that bothers us. It's the fear, trepidation and, and, and upset projecting what the thing could be. It's that, that doubt. And I, you know, I, I got into stoicism due to Tim Ferriss, who I enjoy tremendously. Uh -huh. um, and and I think we'd all benefit from doing a little bit more reading. But I know we're coming up on some time. So I want to make sure that we wrap this up uh, with a note to you that we're going to follow up. I only have two tattoos. They're both quotes. Uh, we'll go into what those are uh, later. But one of the ones that will be the next tattoo is the Ubuntu symbol, which I don't know if you're familiar with it, but you may well be. I am because we are. And the concept of individuality and individualism has become, I think, a cancer. And that doesn't make me a socialist. It doesn't make me wear strange shirts. It doesn't make me want to burn things. It means that I give a shit about other people. It's funny. I, I grew up a Republican somehow growing up in a trailer in Polk County. I somehow believed in uh, a conservative mindset. Now, the conservative party was very different then in many ways. And I probably shouldn't make this political because the 10 listeners I have, five of them will be pissed at me. But whatever. Uh the reality is, at some point, I switched over. Social social liberalism was easy for me because I think social liberal liberalism is just just better. It's fair. It's 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 grounded in a in, uh, in a respect for people's identity and who they are. Uh, but fiscal conservatism is a thing, right? So you can have academic discussions about those things, uh, but the concept that like I used to tell my friends, I don't mind, you know, when I was employed previously, I was paying a lot of taxes, right? I used to have friends bitch about taxes who I knew paid none. They were below the line. And they're like, I don't want my tax money to go to you. You're not paying any income tax, right? I'm paying for it. And I don't care because I do want the world to be a little bit better. I don't want people to go broke because they have cancer. Like, I, I don't think that that's okay. And so this concept of, and I have, wow, I've gotten very preachy right now. Sorry about that. But the the concept of being your brother's keeper and giving a shit about other people should not be lost on us in business. Yes. So uh, with the last few minutes we have, you tell people how they can get in touch with you, the best way to connect, uh, what they should take away from our time today. 
uh, you know, whatever you want to do. Uh, the floor is yours, and I'll go to a solo layout and not mute myself like an idiot. Oh, I appreciate you, Derek. Thank you so much. Um, well, uh, you know, the thing I would say to people is is really to really, you know, tune into their intuition. And really look to, you know, how they can sort of listen to those whispers to, you know, be aware of what their gut is telling them um, uh, in order to and, and and really integrate that with, you know, whatever intellectual framework they're putting together. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, but really like let's sort of do the yin with the yang here to complement. Um, uh my website is h3.xyz. Thank you for sharing that. Um, the best place to follow me is on LinkedIn. Uh, I post every day on LinkedIn. Uh, it's Hugh Edwards. Uh, you could, That is the handle, H-U-W-E-D-W-A-R-D-S. Uh, but you just type my name in and you will find me there. Um, and I have a newsletter that you can subscribe to, uh, which you can also see from my website, where I post each week about, you know, you know, looking at how to integrate that head, heart, and hands in order to really take more inspired action and growth in your life. Well, I really want to thank you for spending the time. Um, it does seem like everyone and their brother has a podcast now, and I don't think that that's bad. Uh, you know, variety is the spice of life, and finding things uh, can, you know, it's interesting how you can leapfrog from one to the next. Like I found the Tim Ferriss uh, podcast a thousand years ago. That's how I found Sam Harris. That's how I, you know, you end up weaving your way through yeah, an interesting topic, an interesting guest. I, I can't tell you how many times there's been a guest on that I'm like, holy shit, this person's really wicked smart. They've got their own content stuff out there and then you can go find the content and consume it. And really that's what we're trying to do here uh, with this podcast is to bring people that I've either been fortunate enough to to meet in my life and learn from, because I think we learn from everyone who's in our life mm -hmm. uh, as we continue to meander down this experiment. Um, and ideally, people can take away uh, lessons from our conversations that are useful or in many ways, develop questions of their own. So please feel free to send in questions, et cetera. But I want to thank you for the time and tell you to to tune into the next version. We always do this on play, on LinkedIn as well. And I'll throw that all in the outro. But Hugh, thanks so much. Thank you so much, Derek. It's a pleasure being here today. I want to thank Hugh Edwards from H3.xyz from coming on the podcast on Plain Spoken for this episode. I want to go through a couple of key takeaways from my session with Hugh, and hopefully uh, maybe you guys had your own takeaways. But one of the, the first ones is around combining rational thought and intuition. You know, we talked about that a little bit. The idea of actually trusting one's gut is really important and combining sort of the concept of intellectual insights and, and your your inspired actions, I think is the phrase he used. That was one of the salient takeaways from Hugh, as well as the power of surrender and opportunities. It's the book that he recommended I read, The Surrender Experiment, was really all about letting, letting opportunities present themselves and having the courage to take those opportunities, even when there's risk. Uh, risk is almost required to find reward. I've had subsequent conversations with folks about trying to eliminate the trough in the highs and lows. And if you try to eliminate those troughs, you're going to fail. You have to realize you're going to have things that go ways you don't expect. And if you can do that uh, and learn from them and maybe you know either decrease the depth of the trough, that's certainly a direction you could go, or decrease the time that you spend in the trough so you could iterate faster and learn faster. That was really, really important. We both waxed on poetic, if you will, about authenticity. Uh, being authentic in your interactions with, with your friends, your family, and your business uh, partners, uh, potential partners, being able to truly be an authentic version of you. Now, if you are authentically an asshole, that can be a problem. So you have to figure out when it's appropriate. Just like using the word asshole in this podcast may not be appropriate to some people. But the reality is language is a tool. And I think that that really got the point across. Uh, the concept of profitable pur profitable purpose, you know, in Hugh's journey, uh, he had an incredible run and I think a couple of different exits, but he wasn't happy. Uh, he he battled his own demons in the form uh, in the form of uh, alcoholism as well, and you know, overcoming those pieces and being able to find his purpose, what he felt was his purpose in life, and then figure out a way to make that profitable was important. And I think that uh, he helps other people find that as well. We all have our own challenges. They're not the same. Um, and so being willing to embark on that in an honest and sincere fashion 
will allow all of us to feel better about what we do day in and day out. And ideally, that will snowball into uh, you know better things in the future. Um, and the last thing was a, sort of a revisit of that sort of acceptance that there are going to be highs and lows and leveraging gratitude. And God knows I am not great at this. Um, being willing to to acknowledge that just because things aren't going great doesn't mean that that things aren't going pretty well. Now there are some people out there that are genuinely having really hard times. And if you haven't traveled internationally, uh, we didn't talk about this too much on the podcast, but I think it's important to realize uh, here in the states. I don't know if you're listening to this from the U.S. I don't know what conditions you're in when you're listening to this, but God knows in my life I've had some pretty crappy conditions, but they're nothing compared to what the majority of the world faces. And so be grateful for all the things that you do have. Be grateful for the challenges. Uh, that doesn't mean you're always going to be happy about it. It doesn't mean you're always going to be in a great mood. And that's okay. Give yourself permission to be pissed off or to be sad or to be angry. But ideally, learn from those things and try and work through them and become better at it and, and, and be better for the people around you that matter the most. Whatever those circles are, whether they're your family, your friends, um, trying to take the lessons that life teaches you. And realize that that this is a long experiment for us in some ways, uh, but we really only get about 75 years on this rock. So let's let's do the best we can to be the best version of ourselves. And how that relates to business is by taking that version of ourselves and sharing it with the world. So I want to thank you for joining us. I want to thank you guys for listening to the podcast. As always, uh, www.plain-site.net is our webpage. Plain Spoken comes out eh, once a month, a couple times a month. Uh, but I'm glad you guys listened. Hopefully you're deriving value from it. If you have questions, fire them into uh, to our email address or follow us on LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, it's, uh, I guess I'm supposed to call it X now, whatever. Um, but we always like to engage with people. And if there are people you'd like me to talk to, uh, I'm reaching out beyond my circle of colleagues to try and expand the influence that we might have. And so if you have folks you'd like me to get on the show, I'm happy to reach out to them because what's the worst I can say? No. So thanks again for listening to Plain Spoken or watching if you're on YouTube. Thanks so much for tuning into another episode of Plain Spoken. I hope today's conversation sparked some new ideas and left you with a few takeaways to ponder or implement in your own journey. If you enjoyed the show and found value in our dialogue, I'd be really grateful if you could hit the subscribe button. Sharing this podcast with your network helps us grow and continue to bring you insightful and engaging content. Don't forget, you can find us on LinkedIn and a few other social platforms. Follow us, interact with our posts, and join the Plain Spoken community. Your thoughts, feedback, and ideas are what keep this conversation going. So please drop us a line or leave us a comment. Thanks again for joining me, Derek Fournier, on Plain Spoken. Keep an eye out for our next episode. And until then, keep growing. What the, what the, what the, what the, what the.